let your ears be attentive to the voice of my pleas for mercy. If you, O Yahweh, would mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness that you may be honored. I wait for Yahweh, my soul waits, and in his word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than watchman for the morning, more than watchman for the morning. O Israel, hope in Yahweh, for with Yahweh there is steadfast love, and with him is plentiful redemption, and he will redeem Israel from all his iniquities. This, this uh, is one of the Psalms that uh, you can clearly see the difference between uh, the name of God, Yahweh, and the, the word Lord, because as you read through, you will see that some of the words Lord in the English translation are a capital L and three small letters, and some of them are a capital L and then three more capital letters, a little bit lower uh, case, but uh, are not a lower case, but a lower font. And so you get two versions of the word Lord, one with all capital letters and one with uh, the capital L and the smaller letters. And just if you're not aware of it, I talk about it a lot, I know, but uh, I think it's significant that the name of God in the Old Testament was uh, obliterated by the uh, uh, leadership of the Jewish people because they were so afraid of using the name of God in vain that they um, just wrote it out, if you will, of the Hebrew Bible. And every time they ran across that word, they would pronounce it as Lord or Adonai, which was uh, the Hebrew word for Lord. Uh, and so this is one of those Psalms, if you read through it in English, you can see the difference between um, uh, one form of the word Lord, which is really the name of God, and another one that just means Lord and Master. Um, Anyway, I, I mentioned before that this, uh, this psalm is one of the many psalms that are called Songs of Ascent. Um, the people would sing these as they approached Jerusalem. And again, it's a song of ascent because they are ascending up to uh, Jerusalem uh, for uh, special holidays and things of that sort. Um, up to Jerusalem was uh, the phrase that they were using because the temple to them was the highest peak in all of Israel, even though it might not have really been the highest peak in all of Israel. Whether you came from the north, the south, the east, or the west, you were always going up to Jerusalem. Uh, in in our situation, we uh, uh, we go up to Bonnie Dune from Santa Cruz. Uh, well, actually from lots of different places because it's up on the hill as well. But uh, if you're up in San Francisco, you probably would say I'm going down to Bonnie Dune rather than up to Bonnie Dune. In, in Israel, everybody went up to the temple. Everybody went up to Jerusalem. And so this Sunday morning, as we if you will, go up to church. We go up, in the pre up into the presence of Jesus along with other believers. We have certain expectations as individuals. Every time we show up in church, we, we come with an expectation. Our expectation might be um, less than conscious because we, we might not really be paying attention to why we're going to church today. It might just be our habit to be here. But um, we do come with expectations. There are some Sundays that people come because they have a prayer request, and we skipped prayer requests, didn't we? Huh. I missed that completely on my outline. 
Um, let's do that. Let's stop. I can stop right here and I can come back to it. But I think we need to hear what, what your expectations are. Uh, why did you come today? What do you need from God? And, uh, uh, and then we'll, uh, we'll, we'll pray a little bit uh, about that and then we'll come back. I just uh, blew right over that stuff. heading back <laughs> towards Psalm 130. Um, as, as we go up, as the people of Israel went up to, uh, up to Jerusalem, as we go up into the presence of the Lord each Sunday, um, and we come with our expectations, uh, some of us need to be healed in our bodies, some of us have questions about our futures and need wisdom. And uh, some of us uh, come just with concerns for our friends and our loved ones. Whatever we bring to church uh, as our reason for coming, it might just be to uh, restore our soul or to be satisfied within us. We find that God in his infinite wisdom will not only bring to us an answer for why we've come, uh, for our purpose, whatever it is that we're bringing to him, but he'll also, in the power of his spirit, speak deep within our hearts um, about the plans that he has for us. And so I just encourage you when you come to church, come up to church, uh, and I'm not saying come back to the property so much as I'm saying when you come, realize that you're coming up into God's presence and listen as he speaks to you words of forgiveness and mercy uh, because he is a loving and caring God. Doesn't matter whether we're gathering for church for Bible study, for prayer. We gather in the name of Jesus, and Jesus told us that when we gather in his name, he's present with us. So it's comforting for all of us to know we somehow mysteriously find ourselves in the very presence of Jesus when we come together. It's not just the comfort of seeing friends or hearing their voices, which always is a wonderful thing. Um, but it is about what happens in our hearts when we're together, what happens in our lives when we choose to come up to be with God and with his family. When I was beginning to know about the presence of God, let's say age of 14 to 16, uh, I felt he was inside a church building. Uh, and if I needed to be with God or felt like I needed to be with God, I would go to a church building. And for me, uh, even in the early ages, uh, early time of my life, I never expected that uh, God was only in one church or another church, that there was one right denomination or anything like that. I, I grew up Lutheran, uh, but, but as far as I was concerned, concern any old church would do. So if it was a church building, I could walk into it. And I did. I felt like I was in a holy place. I felt like I had come into um, God's presence. When I um, got to be 16, had my driver's license, I got my driver's license the day I was 16. I was one of those kids who I had to go. I had my appointment. I went and I um, I, I got my driver's license. Uh, the only thing I messed up on and I almost didn't get my driver's license was something that has uh, 
shown up to me over and over and over again. The guy who was doing the lesson told me uh, as, as I turned onto a street, he says, I want you to turn left at the next block. Well, I was halfway down the block. It was a two lane road. I was in the right hand lane. And so he wanted me to cross over a lane of traffic and get into the left turn lane to make a left turn. And there was a lot of traffic. And so I kept going and turned left when I felt like it was safe, which was the next block. And he dinged me on that one because I didn't stop in the middle of the right-hand lane and wait until the traffic went by so that I could move over and turn left. And I have never believed that that's the right way to do things. Uh, to, to me, you'd be courteous. Uh, I, I'm one of these people that if I can't get where I wanna go, I miss my off-ramp or anything like that, I don't stop in the middle of the freeway, I keep driving. I go out of my way to make sure the people behind me don't end up in a frustrating situation. And I've always been that way. But once I had my driver's license, the first thing I would do every Sunday morning was go to church someplace. If my buddies called up, I had the car, I had the surf wagon, uh, I had an, an old 50, uh, seven Ford two-door station wagon and so everybody wanted to ride with me to the beach and uh, and I would say I'll pick you up as soon as church is over and they said well what time will that be and I said I don't know I'm gonna find the earliest church service I can find somewhere in town I'm going to church and I'll come pick you up but it was important for me to be in church um, I guess I was a little backwards from the normal teenager because uh, all of my life up to teenage, I hardly went to church at all because my parents didn't go regularly. Then I became a teenager and I went to church. And of course, uh, a lot of times we run into the situation where kids go to church because they have to all their lives. And then when the, they become teenagers, they don't go anymore. Well, I was just the opposite of that. Um, when I wanted to seek God's presence during the middle of the week, uh, I, I would go to a uh, spot and uh, every town I lived in, and I lived in a lot of different towns growing up, but every town I lived in, I, I had found my spot. And it was usually a rock near the ocean because that, uh, as long as I had an ocean around me, I was, was happy. Um, and, and I would run to that rock and I would sit on that rock. And so I had, in my life at the time, two places where I could feel the presence of God, inside a church building or on that rock. It was many years later before I realized that not only was Jesus present where two or three gather in his name, but he was present with me wherever I was. And he's always with us. And the Bible tells us he never leaves us. He never turns his back on us. We just don't always recognize that truth that he is there. When I was in seminary, I worked in a small church and had the freedom to go into the sanctuary for hours at a time with no interruptions. And I took uh, a lot of advantage of that time to pray, time to read, time to think, even time to uh, teach myself to play the piano that uh, lasted for a couple of years, and then uh, I'm not sure I could sit down and play anything meaningful any longer. But what I enjoyed the most was basking in the presence of my Lord Jesus. When I go up to church, I go up to be with him and with his family. The Bible uses the phrase to seek the face of Yahweh. I want to see him and I want to be with him. We can't notice it as much on Zoom meetings, but I know that uh, that we try to do that as a church. When somebody joins the meeting, we, we want to let them know we see them. We, we're excited that they have come to be, uh, be with us. And, um, and that happens when we're in, in the presence of one another because we turn around and we get this smile on our face. And even though we can't 
interrupt the conversation that's going on, the person who walks into the room knows that they've been recognized and they've been welcomed into that place. And, and we, we try to do that with Zoom, but it happens more when we are uh, together in person. Uh, we can feel our heart change when, when they enter. We see their face, we hear their voice, and we know that we're in their presence. And, and we know that when we gather together, even in a Zoom kind of setting, where we are separated from one another, but we can visually see we can audibly hear, and we know even in this kind of situation that God in his wonderful wisdom pours out his spirit upon all of us and, and helps us to feel that we are not just at Bonnie Doon Church, not just at a Zoom meeting, but we are with one another in the presence of God. I always think of the um, gosh, this is going to take me way back, but many of you will remember it. The, the um, intro to the Disney uh, Sunday evening program where, where they would show the castle from, um, uh, the, the, from Disneyland and had the picture there. And then from the top of the picture, the, the paint or the color would start to melt down through the through the picture and over the picture and uh, and we'd see something different. Uh, I, I remember that because it, it so vividly pictures for me what the Holy Spirit does for us when we gather together with others. We, we have this uh, sense of the Holy Spirit melting over the top of us and warming us and drawing us close together. And, and it's difficult to describe feeling those presence to other people. Some might say, well, I never felt that, or I don't know this. And, and but, but that's, that's what I feel when I'm in God's presence is that, uh, that, that complete enveloping of who I am and how much he loves me. David in this Psalm cries out to Yahweh begging him to listen to his pleas for mercy. I don't know about you, but there are times that I forget that God does not just dole out mercy, but that he's merciful. And here's the difference. If I believe that God is just a God that might forgive my sins, and I come to him saying, God, I really need you to forgive me. I want you to forgive me right now. I'm coming with the expectation that he might or might not forgive me. And that's more of a human perspective, because as a human, I might run into a situation where I do something that offends somebody, and they may never forgive me. But the scriptures tell us, and are very clear about the fact, that God is not one who doles out mercy to us, doles out forgiveness to us, as he so pleases. But he is a merciful and forgiving God who has that forgiveness available to us all the time. David says in verse 3, no one could be forgiven or acquitted from their sin if God marked sin. If God remembers our sins, we would be found guilty day after day for the same sin because God would continue to hold us accountable for it, like we try to do for other people. But that's not the way it is with Jesus. He died on the cross to bear our sin, to pay the price for us all, once and for all. It does not have to happen again he does not have to go back to the cross. He does not have to be sacrificed again. It's over with. 
And we don't have to pay the price ourselves because he paid it for us. And there's no way we could force God to forgive us even if we tried. But verse 4, David lets in, lets us in on a great truth. With God, there is forgiveness. Our God is a forgiving God. All I need is to let him know I've gone astray and want to come up and be with him again. It's like, I want to come back, Lord. I want to come back. I want to come back to the mountain. I want to come back to my friends. I want to come back to my life with you as my Lord. And he showers his forgiveness upon us. I was reading something about church practice in the early centuries. If someone in the congregation sinned in such a way that the elders thought that person should make a public repentance, they publicly put them out of the church and if the person wanted to come back to church, they were required to go through weeks of fasting and times of repentance so that the people of the church could see that they were truly remorseful for their sin. And once the repentance seemed real, I don't know who made that choice, seemed real and the penance had gone far enough, they would be welcomed back into the church. Wow. I don't think I want to go to a church like that. If I had to go through that, I might not be willing to try to come back to church. It's possible that that's what a lot of people in this world feel like happened to them in their church experience. And they won't come back because they have never fully experienced the mercy and the love of God. God is a forgiving God. And we as people are called to pass that forgiveness on to others. I was reading in Romans um, just the other day and ran across a phrase I had not realized before. In Romans 9, 23, Paul says, he might make known the riches of his glory on vessels of mercy. Paul's talking about the potter, who can make from the clay uh, vessels of earthly purpose, common purpose, and vessels of uh, holy purpose. That, that the, the, the author or the uh, potter can make what it is he wants and, and calls us vessels of mercy. Now, you might have seen that before. You might have thought about that before. But... It, it all of a sudden dawned on me that we are called, we are brought into God's family so that we can be vessels of mercy to the people around us. So that the people around us can receive from us the same kind of forgiveness we've received from Jesus. That they can uh, know by the way we treat them that that God is a merciful God, not that he just doles out mercy here and there to one person, but not to another, but he is a merciful God who doles out forgiveness and mercy to everyone, no matter who they are or what they've done. And that raised that whole question of how good of a vessel of mercy am I? Hmm. We are the vessels of mercy that God has called us to. What do you and I have to offer the world? Well, the good news. And what is that good news? Jesus died on the cross, rose from the dead, so that all people everywhere can be forgiven by God, are forgiven by God. No one ever has to beg from God again. He is a forgiving God. Just come to him and ask him for his mercy, and it is ours for the taking. David in verse 5 says, I wait. My soul waits. I hope in the word. 
The call is to come and to sit in the presence of God, to listen to his word as we read, to sing his praises with our voices. We have the opportunity to share our deepest passions with Jesus. He wants to hear what's on our hearts. David says that his soul waits for God like the watchman longs for the morning to come. What do we find in the presence of Jesus? More than anything else, we find that forgiveness, that he loves us just the way we are. What was the old phrase, warts and all. We're, this is who we are, and God loves us. Well, there might be some things he would like to see us change tomorrow or in the near future. We might have a few more things to repent of, there's more things for the Holy Spirit to reveal in us or out of us. But he does not hold that against us. We are welcomed into his presence. He has never said to me, I don't think, or to you, wait until you get such and such cleared up and then come back and see me. He doesn't give us that kind of statement that says, I need you to become better before I'll welcome you into my home. No, he's one who welcomes us into his throne room because he loves us and we are welcome to come. Put your hope in him. He brings to us the concept of unfailing love. We do not find that anywhere else in life other than maybe our pets. Jesus' love will never end even if we turn our back on him. He will continue to love us no matter what. I have a good friend who walked away from God years ago. She even verbally denounced her faith and she never wanted to talk to him again or even about him. At first, I would avoid talking about God, but I could not do that for long. Then, as time went on, I began to mention my faith by saying things like, you know, I have a different than you do. Or, when I'm going through times like that, I find help from God, even though I know you don't like him or don't want to believe in him. She never criticized my faith. She could not deny my genuineness because I believed in God. She would always let me know that she had turned her back. She's still fighting the truth. I still see her on a regular basis. She cannot deny my love for her. And she cannot help but see a glimpse of God in me. And he's never given up on her in the same way that I've never given up on her. And she has trouble reconciling that with her belief that God doesn't exist. Over time, I believe that God is going to win her back and she will finally understand how much he loves her, no matter what she's done or how much she has tried to turn away from him. God does not give up on us. So when we come to church, when we come to be with him, what is it we're coming to see? When Jesus encountered Bartimaeus on the side of the road, he asked him, what do you want me to do for you? I wonder how you would answer that question this morning. What do you want in the depth of your heart for Jesus to do for you? You don't ever have to say it out loud or tell others about it if you don't want to. But you have to express it to him and let him know how you feel. He could say no. He can say not now. But James says we do not have the answer to our prayers because we have not asked them yet. Ask, taste and see that the Lord is good. Make a list, if you will. Put, it, put in all the hard stuff, the things only God can do. And pray until it comes true or God says no. 
remember watching a movie, The War Room, a number of years ago. It tells the story of one lady and how she began to change her world. She was willing to pray, to go into her prayer closet and pray on a regular basis. Have you become complacent? Have you settled for a good life? What's your passion? How much do you want it done? A lady in the movie was talking to another woman who complained a lot about her husband. And the lady suggested she pray. She said, I don't have time to pray every day. And the lady says, but you apparently have plenty of time to fight losing battles with your husband. She went on, love your husband, treat him with kindness, but do your fighting in the war room, in the prayer closet. Don't fight with people. Fight with God about people. And she also made the comment, a lot of people don't pray because they don't believe it works. But unfortunately, it doesn't work because we don't pray. Come into the presence of God today and let him know what your needs are. As we come to communion, it's a time for us who follow Jesus to look back over that good news that we are forgiven. It's an opportunity for us to realize that he left his place in heaven to come to earth, to live as a man, to teach and to die on a cross so that our sins could be forgiven. Jesus suffered the weight of all the sins of the world on that cross even a moment of feeling separated from his father in heaven. Not because we did the right thing, but because he did the right thing for us. So communion takes us back to that moment when we take the bread, whatever it might be, and we break it and bless it and give thanks to God for what he's done and we eat of it, we are partaking in the body of our Lord Jesus Christ. In the same way we take a cup and it doesn't matter what cup we're drinking or whether we even have a cup at all, whether we might just have a, a, a cup that is air okay but we do this to remember that jesus shed his blood for us that it was because of his death and his resurrection that we can be set free from our sins so he says to us drink Join me in prayer. Lord, as we have this time together today, as we feel your presence in and around us, as we hear the words of your forgiveness for us, the amount of love that you have that will never end, as we think of your, your mercy, not that it's doled out to us, but your mercy that overshadows us because you are a merciful God. Fill us with a sense of forgiveness, a sense of hope, a confidence to walk with you into the future. For we ask it. In Jesus' name, amen.